Nigerian police work to secure the release of an American woman as the State Department issues a travel warning for the West African nation. An anti-Ebola drug being tested in Guinea shows promise. And from statement ponytails to 80s sleek to 60s chic, 2015 is all about the hair. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. We'll have more of those on those stories in a moment. But we begin with the news that the masked Islamic State militant who has appeared in several videos of hostage beheadings has been tentatively identified, but security sources caution that the reports may not be accurate. Reports Thursday quoted friends of Mohammed Mwazi as saying they believe he is the tall London-accented speaker dubbed Jihad John. But VOA's Jamie Detma Imbrom says European intelligence sources are refusing to confirm that Mwazi is Jihad John saying instead that this story is more complicated than that. Uh, the man appears in the videos clad in black with a mask over his face and a holster under his arm. U.S. and British officials have yet to comment on the news reports about his identity. Uh, well, Imwazi is reported to be a Kuwait-born middle-class Londoner who practiced Islam. Friends and acquaintances say they believe he began to radicalize in the past few years after trips to Africa and the Middle East. He is reported to have been a person of interest to British security authorities, although security officials have not confirmed this. According to the Washington Post, which first reported Imwazi's identity on Thursday, his family declined a request for an interview, citing legal advice. Uh, for continuing updates on, his, uh, on this story, visit voanews.com. Well, the United States has charged three men with conspiring to support Islamic State militants in Syria and wage war against the United States. Charges against two Uzbeks and one Kazakh were filed in federal court in New York Wednesday. VOA's Latsa Hoke reports. Two men from Uzbekistan appeared before a judge in federal court in Brooklyn, New York, Wednesday. New York authorities said the hearing for the Kazakh national was held in Florida. Two of the individuals were seeking to uh, fly to Syria. One was arrested at the International Airport, JFK International Airport, as he was getting ready to board that flight. A second individual had a later flight scheduled. He was arrested at home here in Brooklyn. A third individual who uh, we believe helped to organize uh, and finance the trip of the other two individuals was arrested in Jacksonville, Florida. All three men resided in Brooklyn and were legal U.S. residents. Officials say they came to the attention of law enforcement based on statements they posted on social media. As alleged in the, uh, uh, the filing, the idea that uh, uh, it was made quite plain based on their own statements that if they were not able to uh, go, that they would seek to uh, acquire weapons here handguns, uh, machine gun, and seek to attack, uh, uh, very specifically, uh, police officers. One of the three suspects allegedly made threats against U.S. President Barack Obama. U.S. officials say authorities take these types of threats very seriously. The FBI says radical groups and individuals use social media to connect and send their messages worldwide. We are one of the few domestic law enforcement agencies that have that where we can use intel and then seamlessly walk and transfer over and act operationally very quickly in the event that we see something imminent happening. The news of the Brooklyn arrests has sparked concern in New York's sizable Uzbek community. Many fear they could become the target of unwanted attention. A defense lawyer in the case objects to some of the methods U.S. authorities use to identify radical groups and their hierarchy. If the allegations are as stated, I think that the U.S. government needs to figure out another way to uh, approach Muslim men who may, be, who may find some attraction to radicalism. Islamic State has attracted young men and women from many Western as well as Arab countries. An estimated 20,000 foreigners have crossed into Syria to join the group, known for grisly beheadings and other atrocities committed in the territory under its control. U.S. government officials acknowledge that Islamic State is directing a massive propaganda campaign to the United States. Zlatica Hope, VOA News, Washington. 
when Nigerian authorities say they are making progress in their bid to win the release of an American woman kidnapped in Kogi State earlier this week. Reverend Phyllis Soto was working as a Christian missionary when she was abducted Monday from the Hope Academy compound in Ewimoro. Soto, who lives within the school compound, has been a teacher at the school since it was established in 2008. Soto was being seized. Another teacher says he ran out of his classroom after hearing a, a gunshot and saw armed men grab hold of Soto. Uh, the Kogi State Police Commissioner Samuel Ogun Jimlis uh, says every effort is being made to free Sodom. Meanwhile, the U.S. Department of State is alerting Americans of the risks of travel to Nigeria and is urging caution while in the country during the upcoming elections. Nigeria has one of the highest rates of kidnapping. While Somalis living in the U.S. regularly send hundreds of millions of dollars back home to help their families financially. But the U.S. bank that handled more than half of these cash transfers to Somalia has shut down its services. Now, the move has left Somali communities worried for their families back home who are now desperate for new ways to receive the funds. VOA's Amy Katz has more. Once a month for years, Ahmed Ahmed has been coming to Dahabshil, a money service agency catering to the Somali community outside Washington. The taxi driver has sent $200 every month to his family of eight left behind at home, but he couldn't this time. Forget the medicine or, I mean, anything else. The priority is the, the food. If they don't get that money, they don't have a food. They don't have any jobs. At the small money service business inside a Somali store, Hal Hassan, who works as a building concierge, couldn't believe what she was just told. Ah. Why are they all closed? Why, why are they closed? They close. Why? After years of civil war and anarchy, there is no formal banking system in Somalia. So families overseas have to rely on informal money transfer networks known as hawalas to deliver cash to their needy relatives. Merchants Bank of California was the last U.S. bank to handle wire transfers to Somalia. In early February, they announced the service would shut down. The reason likely has to do with the U.S. fight to stop the flow of money that helped funds extremist groups in the region, such as al-Shabaab. Census data shows that 80,000 Somali immigrants live in the U.S. A majority of them send money to their families in their impoverished homeland. Osman Youssef manages the Dahabshil Money Transfer Agency. It's about... Uh between 200 and 300, that's the average. Uh, we also have a lot of people who send $20, $30, $50. In all, more than $215 million in U.S. remittances went to Somalia last year. Now, without cash transfers, Somali community leaders worry about the future for Somalia's children. Farah Mohammed and his group have been building a school with donations from Somali immigrants. The school will definitely stop. There is no way that we can build this school and can do anything. There is a huge, large number of Somali kids that just growing up. And unless they get a right education, right assistance, uh, we don't know what their life will be. Some lawmakers and aid groups have raised concerns about the humanitarian consequences and have called for an emergency plan. Scott Paul is a senior advisor at international aid group Oxfam America. And perhaps most importantly, there are communities of Somali refugees in Ethiopia and in Kenya that have no other way to support themselves. Um, and if, if these companies close down, those refugee camps uh, and refugee communities are going to be in severely dire straits, maybe even worse off than people in Somalia. Congressman Keith Ellison, who represents Minnesota, also said a disruption in remittances would cause greater security risks. And when you know that the Al-Shabaab and the other recruiters will offer a young man a, a, a gun, a wife, and a few bucks, it becomes clear how critical it is. We must fix this remittance problem. The Treasury Department says officials recognize the importance that remittances play in Somalia and are working across the government to consider different options to address the issue. 
But no solution has yet emerged. Somali immigrants are in fear for their loved ones. Really, really, I'm worried about I cannot send the money back home, and I don't know what to do. For producer June So, Amy Katz, VOA News, Washington. Well, Kenyan rangers are driving game further into a 36,000-hectare conservancy to protect the animals from conflict uh, with encroaching humans. Uh, reporter Lenny Ruvaga went along as wildlife officials used trucks and helicopters in the Alpijeta Conservancy to protect game from being killed by locals either for food or protection. Here's his report. <laughs> Deep in the heart of this conservancy in Laikipia, rangers conduct a coordinated foot patrol. Olpejeta is East Africa's largest black rhino sanctuary. It also borders 18 human communities. To stop rising incidents of conflict between animals and the people living here, the rangers are harding game from the edges of the conservancy back into the expansive range. Samuel Muticia is part of a team coordinating this exercise using foot patrols, 4 by 4s and a helicopter. We conduct game drives in such places where, you know, the fence is not um, high profile enough to prevent animals from getting into the communities. And so basically we do this to drive animals from possible areas of conflict into the conservancy. Surrounding local communities have been expanding into wildlife habitats. That means animals are displaced from their natural territory and end up looking for food in populated areas. As a result, locals lose crops, livestock and sometimes their lives. In 2013, 106 people were killed in the country by wild animals, while 520 others were injured. The animals are often killed in retaliation. Willie Okoth commands 45 ranges at Al Pejeta, where he served for 15 years. He says a prolonged dry period this year has intensified animal-human conflict. At the moment, there's drought, and it's quite dry. This is the reason why the animals go off the conservancy and invade farms. So we conduct game drives so as to limit the number of animals that breach the boundaries and keep them in so as to maintain good relations with locals. The Kenyan government has an economic interest in protecting its wildlife, which attracts tourists and creates jobs. Last year, the government passed a law that compensates victims for loss of life or injury, as well as property damage caused by wildlife. But as long as animals and people live side by side, conflict will remain a fact of life. Lenny Ruvaga for VOA News, Laikipia, Kenya. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a call to intensify the fight against neglected tropical diseases. Stay with us. I'm Milar Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondents, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. And our correspondents will do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world. Well, it's time now for a Thursday health update and joining us now is Africa 54 health reporter Lino Mudu with a look at tropical diseases. Hello, Lino. Hello, Vincent. Hello, everyone. The World Health Organization is urging countries affected by neglected tropical diseases to scale up their investment in tackling 17 NTDs in order to improve the health and well-being of more than 1.5 billion people. WHO's new report, Investing to Overcome the Impact of Neglected Tropical Diseases, outlines an investment case and essential package of interventions for these diseases. Neglected tropical diseases like dengue, rabies, sleeping sickness, and leprosy cause blindness, disfigurement, permanent disability, and death, particularly among the poor. Dr. Dirk Engels is director of the Control of Neglected Tropical Diseases Department with WHO. 
This report makes the case for countries to generate their own financing for the control and elimination of the neglected tropical diseases. This will be crucial to ensuring that everyone has access to the same kind of public health coverage for these diseases which have always been associated with poverty. And an annual investment of $2.9 billion is required until 2020 to reach targets set in the WHO roadmap for 2015 to 2020. Annual investments will continue to decrease as diseases are reduced or eliminated. And the World Health Organization has launched a new policy on injection safety to help all countries tackle the pervasive issue of unsafe injections. The WHO also announced that smart syringes that break after one use should be used for injections by 2020. Syringes are also being engineered with features to protect health workers from needle stick injuries and resulting infections. Use of the same syringe or needle to give injections to more than one person is driving the spread of a number of deadly infectious diseases worldwide. Here is WHO Director General Dr. Margaret Chan. With more than 16 billion injections given every year, we cannot afford to have any of them administered in an unsafe manner and the risk of transmitting disease is too high. Of these 16 billion injections, 90% occur in therapeutic services. Unsafe injections can spread several diseases, among them hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. And these are heavy burdens in terms of creating additional work for the health system. The WHO is also calling for policies and standards for procurement, safe use and safe disposal of syringes that have the potential for reuse in situations where they remain necessary, including in syringe programs for people who inject drugs. And in Ebola news, tests have shown that the disease can be transmitted through sex after a patient has overcome the virus. Researchers say traces of Ebola can remain in semen of some survivors for at least 82 days after the onset of symptoms. They say it stays in vaginal secretions for at a much shorter period. Scientists say the testicles are a reservoir for Ebola because white blood cells, which protect the body against infectious disease, are unable to effectively destroy the virus there. The World Health Organization advises Ebola survivors to abstain from sex during a 90-day period following recovery or failing that well to practice safe sex. Lynn Verin is medical coordinator at the Ebola Treatment Center in Monrovia, Liberia. There has been some um, facts that uh, the semen is still infective for 90 days after uh, the onset of the symptoms. In that case, uh, every male survivor that is leaving our um, uh, structure, we give them for that period of time uh, condoms because we think it's very important that they, when they have sex, they have protected sex. So we explain that very well also to the survivors. And observers say the sexual transmission of Ebola has raised the prospect of new infections, even in areas free of the disease, just as the year-long epidemic appears to be receding across the region. And that's your health report for today. Back to you, Vincent. Well, you know, thanks a lot, and be sure to watch the Domo Do's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. We're falling oil prices are dramatically reshaping world economies and today we have a part two in our series on global oil prices. Here's VOA's Caroline Turner. As the price of oil continues to fall, the Wilson Center convened an expert global panel to discuss the economic and political repercussions. Nigeria is so reliant upon oil revenues, they face domestic unrest and security challenges. If they try to cut production, analysts say there is no floor price at which Nigeria will stop pumping oil. Our trading partners do have flows, the multinationals, but I will say that any oil that is directly controlled by Nigeria in any way, and it's not much, but the oil that's controlled by, say, NPDC, will not really have a flow. 
the floor really has to be what is the price. It has to depend on what the price of production of the barrel is, and that differs from um, producer to producer. This implies that if the price goes lower, most African countries will continue to produce and stockpile oil until the price goes back up. We depend on oil. Most of, the, I mean, the government runs on oil. It's uh, the greater percentage. Percentages range. I mean, I think now it's about 75 percent of uh, government revenue that depends on oil. So how do you stop? The impact of lower oil prices on African countries depends on whether the country imports or exports oil. Right now, a lot of the countries have discoveries that the exploration efforts will slow down. The lower the price, the less the exploration. So that is not good news. But for those who are importing, it's good news because it's, it's, it's lower price. In Russia, oil revenues now comprise half the national budget, and falling oil prices could increase economic and geopolitical isolation over the conflict in Ukraine. The Russian national budget depends on oil and gas revenues, uh, well, about 52% uh, last year. When Mr. Putin was appointed president, it was less than 9%. Uh, and so if the price of oil goes, goes down, uh, it, if it is only half of the original price, it would mean that one quarter of the revenues in the uh, Russian national budget will just disappear. Experts say if oil drops below $37 a barrel, it is not profitable for Russia to pump. Basically, uh, the average price of oil production in Russia is about $37 uh, dollars per barrel. If Russia wants to keep production stable, it would uh, need to tackle some hard-to-recover reserves. And those reserves will take about $85 dollars per barrel to produce. And so if such reserves are not produced, we can expect this year some sort of a fall in uh, oil production in Russia, and maybe by the year 2030, Russia will become a net importer of oil. The Russian economy is suffering the negative consequences of falling oil prices as well as Western sanctions over Ukraine. We see now that whatever funds are available to, uh, to the government are being spent not on the revival of uh, some uh, producing uh, economic sectors. The money is spent uh, first on uh, military involvement. In the U.S., frackers have changed the strategic equation of oil production. In the near term, low prices are forcing them to go offline, and oil production jobs are being cut. But frackers are nimble and can more quickly ramp up quick production when the price is profitable. Carolyn Turner, VOA News. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Here is the thing in 2015. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Egypt, one person is killed and five injured in a five-bomb blast around Cairo. In the Comoros, the archipelago celebrates after international observers declare the second round of legislative elections free and transparent. In Liberia, tests show traces of the Ebola virus in semen 90 days after clinical cure. In Togo, supporters celebrate after President Faure Nyasimbe accepts his party's nomination to run for a third term. Finally, in South Africa, elephants will be trained using their exceptional sense of smell to sniff out explosives. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Well, welcome back, uh, and here is what is trending. It's boys to men with lots of fame, fortune, and therapy in between. Well, do you miss uh, the uh, boy bands of the 90s? Uh, then uh, the new documentary Black, uh, Black Backstreet Boys uh, show them 
uh, what you're made of is probably for you. Now, all in their late 30s and early 40s, most of the group are married, have kids, and some have gone through rehab. Now, the revealing documentary commemorates their 20th anniversary, showing the band's highs and lows from the beginning right up to their most recent reunion. Well, and finally tonight, uh, quirky ponytails are the hottest look on the catwalk, and now they are coming to a street near you. 2015 is all about the hair. According to beauty professionals, long lashes and statement hair are back on the agenda at one of the UK's biggest beauty shows. Uh, their showcase is aimed at trade professionals. So what you see here isn't necessarily what you'll get from a spa or a salon near you but whether it's up down cropped or crowned hair is a highlight of the professional beauty industry this year there are all sorts of fusions going on including 80s slickness a bit of uh, grunge 60s flamboyance and statement afros and that is what is trending today now, in the cold of winter, it can be hard to tempt people to leave the warmth of, the warmth of their homes. But as uh, Vina Mapturdi reports, one town of outside Washington has found the perfect incentive, chocolate. It's a festival that will tame to your taste buds. From candies, cookies, pastries to ice cream, everything here is made of chocolate. More than 15 local shops showcase their specialized products at the Chocolate Lovers Festival in Old Town, Fairfax, Virginia. Dave Anderson is with Dave's Candy Kitchen. It's a butter toffee candy that we make. When it's finished cooking, we put chop, uh, chopped almonds in it. The two-day festival attracts about 10,000 visitors. Many of them wait in a very long line in the cold weather to savor the tasty treats with volunteers like Dave Rohr helping out. It's really busy. Um, I was amazed when I walked up to see the line of people here, everybody getting in because lots of people like chocolate. But it's good. It's a good, warm, friendly atmosphere inside. In another room, chocolate lovers can enjoy chocolate chip pancakes served by volunteers. Thank you. They're amazing. They're really, they're really awesome. Like homemade, very, very, very tasty. I think everyone loves chocolate, so it's a nice way to like uh, or some people together. The annual festival, held on a weekend before Valentine, has been around since 1993. It aims to draw visitors to historic Old Town Fairfax and encourage community participation. But it also has a social mission, says Fairfax Mayor Scott Silverthorne. A portion of the money goes to charity. So 25% of every sale at the Chocolate Lovers Festival goes for charities. This way, more people can feel the sweetness of sharing. From Fairfax, Virginia, Fina Muptadi, VOA. And that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good night. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. In a lively half hour, news, sports, health, lifestyle information, comments from our viewers. Africa 54, the best for Africa about Africa. Join us only on VOA.